Très bien. Alors, nous poursuivons avec euh, le professeur Andrew Laird euh, de la Brown University, qui est euh, d'une part un antiquisant euh, classiciste qui a étudié la, la, la tradition classique euh, dans une perspective d'histoire culturelle, mais qui est aussi, et c'est surtout à ce titre qu'il est parmi nous aujourd'hui, un américaniste qui a travaillé euh, sur l'Amérique latine des 16e et 17e, et sur, euh, 16e, 17e siècle, et sur euh, l'appropriation la, des traditions euh, classiques euh, dans le monde colonial. Euh, il nous parlera aujourd'hui du Mexique et euh, de l'enseignement de la logique dans euh, la, 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 la noblesse aztèque euh, au 16e siècle, à Tlatelolco, c'est-à-dire euh, à Mexico. Je lui passe tout de suite la parole. Merci. Um, uh, I'm sorry I'll be speaking in English, but that's why it's all the more important you have a handout. So if you don't have one, don't be shy. Um, I'll, uh, if, if anyone needs one, just uh, send a signal. Um, the Bancroft Library at Berkeley University holds an unusual manuscript in the Mexican language of Nahuatl, with the Spanish title, Logica en el idioma mexicano por Chimalpopoca, and then comes a description in slightly incorrect Latin, Elements of Logic by Johann Gottlieb Heinecke in the true Nahuatl language for the use of Indians, the common term, uh, Indians of Tenochtitlan, translated by Faustina uh, Chimalpopoca. Faustino Chimalpopoca was a Nawa speaker and scholar who taught his native language to students at the Royal University of Mexico and to the Habsburg Emperor Maximilian. After the Second Mexican Empire fell in 1867, Chimalpopoca spent a period of exile in France But after his return to Mexico, he continued to make translations from and into Nahuatl, including this 58-page version of Heinecke's Elementa Logica, which Tuchimal Popoca drafted the year before his death in 1877. The production of a text like that suggests that the tradition of teaching logic to indigenous Mexicans, initiated soon after the conquest and sustained through the colonial period, may have continued into the 19th century. Other Nahua translations of Aesop's fables and Apuleius's Cupid and Psyche uh, circulating in Mexico at the end of the 19th century probably owe their existence to the advanced education of Nahua students, which was initiated in the Valley of Mexico during the 1500s by missionary friars, especially the Franciscans. Developments in logic in New Spain, as colonial Mexico was known, are well known um, because of the achievements at the end of the 16th century of Alonso de la Vera Cruz, Antonio Rubio, and Tomas de Mercado, all of whom were connected to the Royal University of Mexico, which was established exclusively for Spanish students in 1554. But the teaching of logic to indigenous Mexicans had already begun some 20 years before that, four kilometers to the north of Mexico City. The Imperial College of uh, Santa Cruz um, was founded in Tlatelolco in 1536, specifically to educate youths from the Nahua nobility. The individuals who taught and studied logic there have had no impact on the history of the discipline, and none of the figures I'll name in this talk have yet appeared in the bibliographies of Walter Redmond or of the Scholastica Colonialis, but their legacy may have a broader historical influence and a special kind of intercultural value. This talk will be in two parts. Following a brief explanatory account of the function of the uh, college in Tlatelolco, 
the first and longest section will address the role of logic in the trivium and its broader importance in the environment of the college. Questions which have been uh, completely neglected in existing historical surveys of the education of native Mexicans in this period. And then um, my shorter uh, second and final part will look more broadly at dialectic and disputation in the, colleague, uh, in the college and its significance for the Christianization of New Spain and the production of evangelical texts in Nahuatl. I'll begin with the nature and function of education in Santa Cruz de Tlatelolco. Um, and some Spanish officials and missionary friars shared the view that youths from the indigenous elites should receive a higher education. The objective was to consolidate Spanish control over a newly subjugated population by creating an appropriately trained governing class from the indigenous nobility. And there were precedents for this with the teaching of native youths in Hispaniola and the sons of converted Muslims in Granada. So on this basis, the Imperial College of Santa Cruz was inaugurated by the Franciscans in 1536 to prepare Nahua students for a career in public service as magistrates and community leaders. Santa Cruz was not unlike Oxford or Cambridge colleges founded during this period. A chapel, dining hall, and accommodation were arranged around a cloister, all built out of the gray volcanic stone purloined from the ruins of the great temple of Tlatelolco. The Latin curriculum followed Erasmus's prescriptions, so the Mexican students read very much the same texts as English boys at St. Paul's School in London, studying Cato's Distics and Aesop at elementary level before progressing to read Cicero and Virgil. The course of study was the trivium, and this training in clear thinking and expression enabled Indian students not only to become judicious and eloquent leaders, but also translators from Latin into Nahuatl of the religious texts that were needed to, to help convert their people to the Christian faith. The success of the system is demonstrated by the careers of several alumni, such as uh, Montezuma's nephew, Antonio Bellariano of Azcapotzalco, who taught in the college before uh, becoming uh, a governor of his ancestral polity. And that was a repeated pattern. Um, and that success is also demonstrated by the energetic translation of Christian doctrines, catechisms, readings, and devotional texts into Nahuatl, and the composition of original texts in that language from the 1540s into the 1600s. So the use of the Latin alphabet and European protocols to create a Nahuatl literature was perhaps the college's most enduring legacy. But now I'll turn to the role of logic in the education that the students received and its broader role in the culture of the college. As I've indicated, these issues have been overlooked by historians. Um, there seems to be a general uh, reluctance to um, consider the trivium in general um, as 20th century historians have a tendency to impose more uh, romantic ideas of what a Renaissance literary education was like on the reality of how the students in the 1500s were really taught. Um, but having said that, primary, primary sources reveal next to nothing in detail about the curricula or the methods of instruction. The numerous testimonies we have about the capacities of the Nawa students emphasize their expertise and facility in Latin, and sometimes their eloquence, but there's never any mention of their aptitude for logic and dialectic. Cervantes de Salazar's testimony about Antonio Valeriano uh, commends him for being in no way inferior to our own Latin grammar teachers, learned in the observance of Christian law and very devoted to eloquence. Um, and a Franciscan chronicler, Motolinia, early on reported the students astonished their teachers by elaborating on their speeches and disquisitions 
in Latin, but he did not state what those speeches and disquisitions were about. The general lack of information any of the Franciscan chroniclers supplied about their teaching methods or content, whether for grammar or rhetoric or logic, suggests that those methods were the same as those used in Europe. There was no need to describe methods and curricula to readers who already knew them. But the chroniclers Fray Jerónimo de Mendieta and Fray Juan de Torquemada did at least identify the individual teachers. Uh, Torquemada's testimony is the most specific and informative we have. Uh, it's on the handout, but I'll, I'll read it out. They had notable and weighty masters in Latinity after Fray Analdo de Basasio, such as Fray Bernardino de Sahagún, who was in this college for 40 years, and Fray Andrés de Olmos. And for rhetoric, logic, and philosophy, they had the very learned Fray Juan de Gaona, Fray Francisco de Bustamante, and Fray Juan Foucher, all of whom, except the latter, had excellent Mexican languages, and in truth, it can be said, none has surpassed them. The way in which Torquemada grouped rhetoric, logic, and philosophy together might suggest he saw little need to discriminate between them. But there may be correspondences between the subjects and the individual teachers he named on the basis of their known writings and independent testimonies. Mendieta stated that Fray Juan de Gauna was an excellent rhetorician. According to Francisco Cervantes de Salazar, someone called Bustamante was later a magister of dialectic at the Royal University, while Jean Fauché, a doctor of law from Paris, had expertise in theology and canon law, which would have equipped him to teach philosophy. There are no writings attributed to the logician Francisco Bustamante. But Cervantes de Salazar's Academia, a 1554 dialogue in Latin celebrating the newly founded Royal University for Spaniards, described uh, Bustamante as follows. He is very well versed in philosophy and dialectic in which he is a master, and because he has tirelessly taught Mexican youths for 26 years, there is hardly anyone who speaks in public or teaches who would not have been his student. And this identification is underlined by the fact that the uh, Bustamante in Cervantes is said to have previously taught native youths. That's the implication of Juventutum Mexicanam. And this would have to have been at Tlatelolco. But the claim he'd done so for 26 years would mean he would have begun in 1528, and that can't be right. Bustamante only reached New Spain in 1542. But from the mid-16th century onwards, the College of Santa Cruz de Tlatelolco probably shared ideas, teaching practices, and maybe even teachers with the Royal University, so that some of what we know about the university can be applied to the college for Indians during its middle period. The existence of both institutions was due to the efforts of the same man, Fray Juan de Zumarraga, the Franciscan Bishop of Mexico. Zumarraga provided the college at Tlatelolco with a library. Following his death, more of his books ended up there, even though they'd not been directly bequeathed. There were several titles on logic, and those in the adjacent convent of Santiago would probably also have been available for the Mexican students. Uh, inventories were made in 1572 and 1584 of the books in the college, as you can see on page two of the handout. As these inventories were for bureaucratic records rather than scholarly purposes, the listing of the items was crude, incomplete, and often incorrect. The very first item cited on uh, handout page two from uh, 1572, uh, De Lexica, attributed to Siliceo, was not a mysterious dictionary or a treatise on uh, vocabulary, but uh, Juan Martin Silicius's first elements of dialectic. 
So uh, dialectica is just di uh, dialectic. Um, and the uh, strange way that the words are spelled shows that the writer of this catalogue must have been hurriedly noting the details of titles and authors while someone else was reading off the titles of the books. Both the inventories list in a random ma manner books on all kinds of subjects, grammars, vocabularies of Latin, Greek, and Nahuatl, uh, humanist encyclopedias, Bibles, cosmography, natural history, classical poetry, ancient history, and so on. The first inventory has 55 titles, the second 51. Though uh, it's odd there are no titles common to both lists, most of those enumerated in 1584 were probably already there uh, in 1572 because the contents of um, many of the works mentioned are obviously recalled in numerous writings produced some 20 or 30 years earlier by native students and alumni. The titles on logic given in bold type on the handout together constitute one-tenth of the books which we can be certain were in the College of Santa Cruz during the mid-16th century when it flourished as an educational institution. The majority of titles appear to be textbooks, and they were relatively recent in date, produced in the early to mid-1500s. There's no significant preponderance of Iberian texts for the logical works, and this was also the pattern for the college's books on grammar and rhetoric. Um, uh, Pierre Tartare's uh, Scotism was favored by the uh, Franciscan order, uh, so perhaps that's not a surprising inclusion. In the 1980s, uh, the Mexican scholar Miguel Matez um, compiled another list of 377 volumes which had been kept in the college and the Franciscan convent of Santiago Tlatelolco. Some of those were, may have been acquired after the college declined as a teaching institution in the 1580s. And later imprints like Domingo de Soto's 1582 commentary on the physics or the 1600 Coimbra de Anima could have been added at any time in the 17th century. Um, it's interesting that in this list, Dun Scotus becomes prominent when none of his works were included in the 16th century uh, inventories, and that might not be a uh, coincidence. Perhaps they didn't want to declare them. Um, it's certainly the case that Scotus doctrine was provoking controversy at the Council of Trent, but despite the Counter-Reformation, it had an enduring influence in New Spain, and Veronica Murillo has drawn attention to elements of Scotist thought in Fray Juan de Bautista's Advertencias para los Confesores, which was authored in Tlatelolco and uh, published. I think it was also published in Tlatelolco in 1600. At least 70 of the items in Matas's larger ca catalogue are now part of the Sutro Mexicana collection in San Francisco State University. Nearly all the books from Tlatelolco contain extensive handwritten marginal notes, underlinings, and glosses by members of the college. There are often several different scribes in the more heavily annotated volumes, and examination of these marginalia might help ascertain more about how the surviving books on logic, including Tartare's commentary on Petrus Hispanus, were read and used. But nobody's done that yet. A different kind of commentary can be found in the epigrams transcribed on page three of the handout, which were composed in the early 1540s. Their author, Cristobal Cabrera, was under the tutelage of uh, Bishop Juan de Zumarraga at the time that the bishop was founding the College of Santa Cruz. Cabrera never attempted to publish these uh, flippant reflections, which are still languishing in manuscript, um, but the poems are of a, some interest because the classical philosophers, historians, and orators whose work they remark on have nearly all been attested in the Tlatelolco Library. And as you can see, the epigrams offer a more personal response to the works of Aristotle, Rudolf Agricola, and Caesarius. Number four commends reading Aristotle in the original Greek, and five celebrates the logic, physics, and ethics. 
But epigram six shows um, caution about the philosopher's lack of Christian charity, anticipating the valediction uh, Bartolome de las Casas issued to Aristotle uh, in his defense of the Indians. Epigram 14 characterizes Rudolf Agricola's innovative application of Aristotelian and Ciceronian topics, Loki, to rhetorical argumentation, while 15 comments on uh, Joannes Caesarius's dialectica, grimy barbarism has fled far from here. Those words echo a letter Erasmus wrote um, to Caesarius himself. So now I'll come to my shorter final part. As well as logic, the teaching of dialectic also involved disputatio, the capacity to construct arguments and discern fallacies in the arguments of others. The conduct of a disputation as a formalized debate was the obvious manifestation of logic in praxis, whether in performance or in writing, in the schoolroom and beyond, resolving differences of opinion between opposed parties, as well as establishing or uncovering scientific or theological truths. One particular disputation recounted by Geronimo de Mandieta was of crucial importance for the uh, very uh, function and nature of uh, the College for Indigenous Students at Tlatelolco. Mandieta relates that an unnamed friar, in fact it was a Dane, uh, Daciano, um, believed that the church in the Indies was mistaken not to receive native ministers from among its converts, as in the early church. He thus believed that holy orders should be conferred on the Indians and that they should be made ministers and priests. But Fray Juan de Gauna, the instructor, instructor of uh, um, philosophy whom I mentioned earlier, convinced Daciano of his error in a public disputation. Mendieta tells us that uh, Gaona's ap apologia, or defense of the Franciscans' opposition to indigenous clergy, was written down and remained in circulation. Gaona's treatise, entitled Antidota, to some propositions by one renowned theologian is mostly lost. But the bibliographer Beristain preserved the opening, which is on the handout. And this excerpt indicates the methodical way in which Gauna answered each one of his opponent's points on matters of doctrine. The controversy is significant because both protagonists were instructors at the college. And it also shows that many histo modern historians are mistaken in their view that the main purpose of the college was to train an indigenous clergy, or that the Franciscans were generally supportive of such an idea. It's difficult to find hard evidence of the native scholars' training in logic. There are no equivalents to the impressive uh, Latin tratados or scholastic commentaries on Aristotle, which soon emerged from the universities of Mexico and Lima. Um, nothing like that was ever produced in Tlatelolco because the institution had urgent and quite distinct objectives to prepare students for positions of leadership in their communities and to enable them to put liturgy and portions of scripture into their own languages. For the latter objective, at least, logic would have been useful. The ability to define terms and make accurate statements, considering implications and drawing inferences, may help to explain why the Nawa translators were able to redact texts that were free of all um, heresy and defect. Those are the words of Fray Bernardino de Sahagún, the missionary linguist who worked in the College of Santa Cruz for more than 40 years. But there are signs of the native students' general formation in dialectic in some of the texts they produced in Nahuatl, which also show evidence of European rhetorical techniques. Uh, one example could be uh, Fray Juan de uh, Gaona's um, uh, Colloquios de la Paz y Tranquilidad Cristiana, which was composed with the help of an indigenous scholar called Anando de Rivas. 
These colloquios have never been edited or translated from Nahuatl, and the work is often believed to be philosophical, presumably because scholars are thinking of the rigorous nature of um, Gaona's antidota against Daciano. Although a number of ancient uh, thinkers are named, and they're conveniently highlighted in, in red in, in that image, um, uh, the excerpt on the top of uh, page four of the handout, which uh, reproduces that sentence, intriguingly mentions Plato, Pythagoras, Architas, and Apollonius of Tyana. There is no serious philosophical argumentation in the Colloquios, not even in chapter five, which is devoted to the varied forms of knowledge in the soul. But its format, 20 exchanges, dialogues in Nawat, in which a collegian is instructed by a friar or padre, seems to be based on the convention of the classroom quaestio. A later, more ambitious Nawa work, uh, Fray Juan de Mejangos's Espejo Divino, which hasn't been edited either, is presented in exactly the same way. Um, but another manuscript, the Colloquios de los Doce, Colloquies of the Twelve, uh, was prepared in um, uh, Spanish and in Nahuatl by four students at Tlatelolco, including uh, Antonio um, Valeriano, under Saragun's direction. Um, the work pretended to reconstruct the earliest conversations between the Aztec high priests and the first 12 Franciscan missionaries in Mexico. Um, the colloquios contain a moving speech in which a Mexican priest of the idols supposedly defended his gods. When the Aztec priest explains that he will advance two or three arguments to counter what he and his companions have heard, he is opposing an assertion which the friars had made earlier in chapter three, that no one will ever be able to contradict scripture. Um, the high priest's uh, narratio, this is all summarized on the last page of your handout. Um, his narratio, labeled B in the manuscript, recapitulates the Franciscans' claim that the Aztec's divinities are not gods, and then counters that proposition. The ancestors of his people told them no such thing. A confirmatio in C then sets out the attributes of the Mexican gods, describes where they live amidst flowers and greenery in Tlalocan, a place unknown to mortals, and in D lists Tula, Tamoanchan, Teotihuacan, and other mythical locations in which their worship was initiated. All that is in order to compete with and to counter the Franciscans' earlier emphasis on the importance of Rome, a place which the Aztecs were told they could never see or know. The refutatio in E to F consists of a series of admonitions. It would be unwise to change laws of ancient standing. The gods might be provoked and the people rise up if their traditional beliefs are rejected. It's advisable to proceed slowly and calmly. These appeals to act in ways which are re respectively practical, safe, and prudent correspond to European classical topoi of utile tutum and prudence. Yet this speech continues to be cherished by ethno-historians who have followed Miguel Leon Portilla, Georges Bordeaux, and others in regarding it as a unique and authentic vehicle of pre-Hispanic Aztec thought. But it obviously consists of a formal refutation of the friar's earlier argument, point by point, in the style of a dialectical disputatio. In addition, the structure of the speech is in perfect conformity with the dispositio recommended in the rhetorics of Cicero and Quintilian. Decisive evidence that the native translators were directly applying their knowledge of uh, Latin logic and rhetoric to the composition can be seen in a reference to the Aztec speaker's opening Captatio Benevolentiae. This classical device of winning the audience's goodwill is easily expressed in Spanish, captando la benevolencia, uh, but the Nahuatl could only be an approximation. He implored them to excuse the speech that was a little long. 
uh, this speech is getting long, so I'll rapidly conclude. The existing absence of research on the teaching of logic to native Mexican students in the mid-1500s is not easy uh, to remedy because of the paucity of specific data. There are no surviving lecture notes or essays by students or anything like that. We have to depend on the records of the books that were available in the college at the time. And for that, the haphazard catalogues of the college's holdings in the Codex Mandieta provide a better indication than the fuller lists compiled by Miguel Matez or even Francisco de la Rosa Figueroa in the 18th century. But annotations in the surviving volumes in Mexico City and in the Sutro collection in San Francisco may reveal something about the methods of reading. In the end, we don't know ex exactly what went on. And I suspect that the Franciscans adjusted their teaching to meet the unusual objectives of the College of Tlatelolco and also to harmonize with the principles of the Devotio Moderna, which had profoundly influenced them. But in addition to the practical benefits that derive from the training of indigenous scholars in logic, that training might have had a further symbolic and ideological value if we think of the Valladolid controversy and other debates about the status and capacities of Native Americans which were being conducted at the same time in Paris, Rome, Seville, and Salamanca, as well as Mexico City. If the Indians' literacy in Latin and their pursuit of the Studia Humanitatis showed that they were civilized and human in the fullest sense, then their capacity for logic would have been incontrovertible proof that the Indians were rational. Thank you. <laughs>